All right, let's take a look at this iron hypothesis. As I said at the opening of our lecture, iron has been hypothesized to be a nutrient that limits phytoplankton in certain regions of the world ocean, something that was really put forth by uh, a gentleman up at um, John Martin, up at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories near Monterey, California. And what he found or what he hypothesized was that if we add iron to these iron poor regions of the ocean, we can stimulate phytoplankton productivity. So in this idea of stimulating iron, stimulating phytoplankton growth using iron, some people came up with the idea that maybe we could use this as a solution for global warming. Here's how it works. A ship goes out, throws a bunch of iron in the water, measures the concentrations of phytoplankton in the water previous to the dumping of the iron. It comes back at a later time and lo and behold, what do they find? Higher concentrations of phytoplankton. And in these types of experiments, which have now been done in several different locations in the world, the first ones were done on the equator. They did some down in the Southern Ocean. They've done some up at Station P in the North Pacific as well. In all of these experiments, the addition of iron has led to increases in the concentration of phytoplankton, at least increases in the concentration of phytoplankton that are limited by iron, namely diatoms. So while nitrate concentrations are high, and in some places silicate concentrations are high, iron concentrations being low were limiting the growth of phytoplankton. So when we added iron to the water, the phytoplankton bloom. Is that a cure for global warming? Can these iron-stimulated phytoplankton pull carbon dioxide out of the air and save the world? Well, the answer is probably not. There seem to be some problems with this idea, mostly because what has to happen is that carbon has to sink and become buried on the seafloor. If you remember our illustration of the biological pump, you remember that for carbon to actually be removed permanently from the atmosphere, it has to go through all the different kinds of organisms and exchanges of processes that happens and eventually be buried permanently on the seafloor. Only when that carbon is permanently buried on the seafloor is it removed from the system, removed permanently from the atmosphere. And what some of these experiments have actually found, and particularly recently, is a lot of that new carbon that's produced from those phytoplankton that are now iron-rich and stimulated, well, it ends up just being eaten and respired, and that CO2 goes right back into the air. There still remain some enterprising business people and some really clever and brilliant scientists working on this problem, and you can uh, Google for iron fertilization and find some of these companies that are actively involved in trying to geoengineer a iron fertilization solution for global warming, and who's to say that they might not discover some way of helping that carbon sink down to the seafloor either by taking advantage of seasonal cycles or by pumping uh, nutrients in a certain way that causes the phytoplankton to sink out very rapidly before they can be eaten by the, by the zooplankton. There are many possible scenarios that might work for it, but most scientists remain skeptical, skeptical of iron fertilization as a way of combating global warming and as a way of using the ocean to help remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And there's always the idea that you're tinkering with food webs and tinkering with something that we just really are just beginning to understand and don't understand very well. And some people are uncomfortable with that idea of messing with Mother Nature, so to speak. So, of course, as we always have at the end of our lectures, if you're interested in learning more about this, I suggest you try the exploration activity. At the end of the chapter, we explore phytoplankton through uh, investigation and modeling. There's some great activities there for uh, learning about how oceanographers are using satellites to study phytoplankton. There's also some resources on the McGraw-Hill website, and you might also find some resources on this on my own website, Explore World Ocean. Dot com. And I also suggest, of course, the Blue Planet series. There, 
a series called The Seasonal Sea, as well as one that's really hard to get called Seasons of the Sea, um, are excellent looks at the seasonal cycle and again, the physical, chemical, and biological processes that interact to make the ocean work as a system. Well, I know it's been a long lecture, and I know it's been a lot of kind of complicated chemistry and a little bit of complicated physics and lots of different things in biology going on, but having a firm foundation and understanding of phytoplankton and primary productivity in the ocean will help you better appreciate not only just the ocean, but your life as well. After all, the air we breathe, half of it comes from the ocean. The atmosphere that we live in, well, it's moderated by the phytoplankton in the ocean. It keeps us at a comfortable temperature, and a lot of the food we eat comes from the ocean as well. So hopefully this lecture has given you some understanding of the importance of phytoplankton and the role they play in our lives. Well, as always, I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you next time, and if you have any questions, please feel free to email me.